Good morning, church. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. And before I get into the formalities of the day, I, I might never get an opportunity like this. Where I will be in front of Aruka Church like this and get an opportunity to address you. I want to let you know that from the bottom of my heart, every individual, even though I don't know you individually, as a collective, and as a church, I love you. I say this because since the first day I walked into this place, which was last year in February, I have received nothing but love. And because we are a congregation, we might not get to meet. I'd just like to let everybody know that to my peers, you have a brother and you have a friend. And to the elders, you have a son in me. And Muruti just made mention that I recently lost my father. But God in his infinite wisdom, there's a scripture that says, give and it shall be given back to you. Press down, shaken together and running over. So as, I don't, I'm not saying that I gave my father, but the Lord took my father. But in return, he gave me a catalog of fathers in Aruka Church. And I'm really excited uh, for the launch of the men's ministry where I will be abusing the men in advance. I will take advantage and ask you hundreds of questions because I'm always eager to learn. And let me also thank uh, my pastors, my parents in the house, uh, Pastor Sharon and Pastor Muluki. For, for trusting me and giving me this opportunity to share the word with you this morning. They are very supportive parents and mentors. And they're the type of people that if they find out that you know how to paint, you'll find that they have bought you paint and they want you to paint the entire hospital. They will always nurture your gifts and they will always nurture your talents. Thank you so much. Uh, with that being said, the title, of, the title of my message today is Kingdom Heritage. Because as citizens of the kingdom, we are not orphans. We have a father who is in heaven. And while he's in heaven, there's a lot that he has allotted to us. We're going to be taking our scripture from Galatians 4. Uh, can the technical team please uh, project it? Galatians 4 reads, What I am saying is that as long as an heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to the guardians and the trustees 
Until the third time by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman and born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. It is a very sad and unfortunate situation that sometimes as Christians we do not know what we have. We do not know what we are entitled to. Because salvation is entry level. But just going through the kitchen does not mean that you have access to the various rooms in a house. And that is the sad reality that we find ourselves as Christians. And the word of God says, unless we come to a fullness of understanding or a place of maturity. We cannot access these hidden treasures that are in Christ. Now, maturity is not subject to age. But it's subject to self-actualization. I'll give you an example with children. If you leave children in a room and they either fight or break something and then an elder comes into the room and asks what happened or who broke this? Both children will begin to point at each other. There is a lack of accountability. None of them will own up to their mistake. In like fashion, go into a marriage counseling situation and ask the couple what happened. Everybody begins to point fingers. And you realize that there's still that lack of maturity that is, ex- that is exhibited by children. Even though that these people are adults. And, and there's an expectation that as adults, they may be that accountability. Another example of this is the story of the prodigal son. When the other son had taken his inheritance, as a sign of a lack of maturity, everything that he needed was around him and was in his father's house. Most people say he was too forward. And the decisions that he made got him moving around in circles and eventually he had to come back to his father's house. But this is not the only individual that is in the story. But he's the one that is spoken about most. He had an older brother who was tending to his father's livestock when his younger brother returned. On his way back, he asked, what is all this halabaloo? What is, what is the celebration about? And one of the servants told him that your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Instead of him being excited, he threw a tantrum. He threw a tantrum like a child. 
He did not approach his father to have a conversation to understand what's happening. He went in the opposite direction. But as we have seen in the play that the Sunday school, and congratulations to the Sunday school for such a wonderful presentation. The wisdom of King Solomon was exhibiting the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is the wisdom that is expected of a father. The father of the prodigal son went to his son who's throwing a tantrum. And in his infinite wisdom was able to mitigate the situation and let him know that he too is loved and that he must not compete with his brother. So from the scripture that we are reading from Galatians, the first point that we realize is there is a lack of authority for one who refuses to mature. Lack of authority. Uh, from the beginning of the Bible, the first thing that God gives man, he gives us dominion over this real estate called earth. And this real estate here is our inheritance. But as Christians, sometimes we find ourselves that we are at the bottom of the food chain. Because we are yet to access the infinite wisdom of God. There are many treasures that lie in the word of God. And it is through the spirit of the God interpreting these treasures to us that we are able to access them. When we speak of treasures, we're not only speaking about the riches of the world. We are speaking about virtue. We are speaking about the characteristics and the qualities that when you do have the riches of the world, the qualities that can help you maintain and manage these. I'll give an example with people in an organization. Usually you would think that the person who's the top, who's the either CEO or the managing director, does the least. But we fail to understand that that individual has developed capacity. Over the years, that has placed them in that position. It is a highly unlikely or very rare or seldom that you would find such an individual involved in bickering and gossiping and causing trouble in an organization. But rather you find that they are able to manage a collective of people. They are able to drive a vision forward. And back to the authority that God wants to give us. God grants us a vision at a particular time in the hopes that we will cultivate ourselves to a place mentally where we are able to actualize this vision. The second point that we find from the scripture that we read is that we are operating below our potential. I would like to give an example with uh, when, when I say we're operating below our potential there might be opportunities that are available to us but we don't access these opportunities because we don't know what we have 
sometimes because of how we conduct ourselves. I usually go around in high schools talking to students about my experience, which I'll share shortly. And there's something that is very synonymous with them, and I'd like to read the scripture before we get to it. It says, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. There's a scripture that says, be no longer conformed to the way of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a way in which we do things as Christians. Or there's a way in which we do things as humanity in general. But when we are grafted into Christianity, we're supposed to learn a different way of doing things. Sometimes the different way of doing things seems backward. Like when somebody slaps you on the other cheek to give them the other cheek. I'll give you an example about the, these students uh, that I was talking about. There is a walk that they have, and I don't know where it came from, where it originates from, and it differs from different individuals. The, the, hand, the hand will be here, and then they slant back, and then they walk like they're about to fall down. And then they go to the mother and say, Hey, old lady. <laughs> I knew the translator wouldn't get that one. Uh, basically saying that the month has ended, give me 50 pula so I can go and check my friends. So I usually tell them that this behavior that you are adopting, the easiest way to succeed in life is to copy. To copy people who have succeeded. I've never seen anybody coming out of a Range Rover area. The only ones who do that are like myself before I got saved who drive Golf 5s Diverpa. And they're driving with their head by the steering Changing wheel. gears in a way that is unorthodox. When some of these things happen, your parents are observing. And this is a message to my fellow youth. Your dad will see, Oh, Manala Cruzakera, I am Marakeng. Or if I give this one cruiser and send them to the Kekel Post, he will be swallowed by the sand. And the car will come ruined. And maybe the gearbox will be ruined as well. Because you are failing to mature. And in that same vein, there will always be a family member somewhere around who always gets sent to the farm. Who gets to know more about your inheritance while you are at Pretty Girls Love Ama Piano? Now, anything that you do, my late dad once taught me, sit down and weigh the benefit. If there's no benefit, there's no point in doing it. And that is something that we have to consider. I would like to give a, a, a testimony in the middle of the sermon. Of how, of how I got here. Many years ago, 
I don't recall how many to be precisely, but it's more than a decade. In this very hall, at those bathrooms, uh, it's the ladies' bathroom currently. I was schooling here in Rainbow, Rainbow. doing my Form 1. Form 1. And I went to those toilets uh, early in the morning before anybody was around. And I had two bottles of alcohol. I opened the toilet and put them in the water. Uh, not the toilet where you sit, but the, the place behind, and I kept it there and I closed the place. And then after school, I called my friends and I came and showed them my hidden treasure. And we began to indulge. I very much doubt that uh, we were drunk, but we behaved like it because we had seen it somewhere. And this is a message to the parents. As much as the parents are watching if you are ready to be sent to the cattle post, the children are also observing certain behavior from the parents. I share with my family countless times when it is a book Christmas. We gather around and there's bottles of alcohol and that is what transpires for days on end. And there are young cousins around us who are observing this behavior. Automatically their inhibitions are dropped. Automatically let's all class. Yes. And, and when they now come into these situations, like in high school, when, and people offer them certain things, they are likely not to decline because it's the very thing that happens at home. Long story short, from that uh, saga here with my alcohol, a few weeks later, I got suspended from school. I was already on a certain type of trajectory. I then, at the end of the year, because I had created such a bad name for myself in the school, my parents took me to boarding school in South Africa. Within two years, at the age of 15, I had two police cases in South Africa. At one point, I was collected by a police van from the school with my friends. And my saving grace was that I was a minor and they couldn't detain me. But nonetheless, there was a police case. And as I had done here in Rainbow, I did the same in Kimberley where I was. And I had to come back to Botswana and I went to GSS. When I got to GSS, I started smoking marijuana. I started selling it to other students at some point. And uh, at the end of my Form 5, my results were dismal. Uh, parents in their love for their children afforded me a second chance so I can try and better my results. Uh, they took me to LKC where I failed again. The only thing that had changed was the environment but the product was the same. I then started going to tutors uh, on the third year now where eventually I made it to university. When I got to university at some point 
uh, usually the government delays with our, with our allowance and it came three months later. When I got my money, I, it was in an envelope and I was ready to leave for South Africa. To go and have a very good time. <laughs> and uh, long story short, within that time frame, I, I had gotten tired of marijuana because I felt like I've reached the different heights. I started doing cocaine. And as it is not rocket science, this, this lifestyle and the education don't go hand in hand. I eventually dropped out of university. And then that means my finances were a bit low because there was no allowance. I got introduced to cheaper alternative drugs. And as it progressed, I spiraled out of control to a point where I realized I was an addict. I did drugs almost every single day. The only time I wouldn't do it is when my body was crashing and I needed to recuperate. I moved around in these circles for about seven years of my life where I was in active addiction. I cried many tears at some point when I realized that I couldn't help myself. I was very desperate for change and I didn't know where to find it. I would watch these TV channels where there's certain uh, men of God, they'll tell you to touch the screen. I was, I was very desperate. Nothing happened. Nonetheless, I did not stop praying. I knew that my only hope in this uh, tumultuous situation is God. But I didn't know how because I didn't know God. One day I woke up and there was something inside of me that I could not control and that was very compelling. Uh, whatever it, I, it wasn't a voice, but I understood what it was saying, that before the end of the day, I must go to church. If I had not made it to church on that day, I might not have been alive today. When I was on a drug binge, I would leave the house for about three days. And in those three days, no food will enter my mouth. There would be so much alcohol in my system and the catalog of drugs in my system. Whenever I liked a particular drug, whatever is available, I would take it at the time. So on that day, I went to church. An altar call was made. I don't remember much of the message. I just remember that I needed salvation. At the tail end of the message was how much Jesus can save us. I gave my life to Christ on that day. The following end, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit on that day. The following day, because I, I was an addict and I had the habits, my mind was not renewed. I continued with what I knew best, and I did it for about a week, but Sunday I was back in church. I did this for a sum of two weeks. 
Midweek I'm on the drugs, Sunday I'm in church. At the end of that second week on a Saturday morning, I had an encounter at 4 a.m. while I was sleeping. I had an encounter that changed my life. I met Jesus Christ and he changed my life. Since that day, until this day today, and in eight days from today, I will be seven years clean. Everything disappeared in one instant. I did not go to rehab. I did not have withdrawal symptoms from cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, cat, crack. Everything left my life that day. Since that day, I then asked Jesus, what next? Because like I said at the beginning of my message, salvation is entry level. I saw a lot of people who were Christians that I found in the church not living the fullness of what Jesus has for them. I inquired of the Lord how to live a full Christian life. How do I not become the old person? And the scripture that I highlighted earlier be no longer conformed to the way of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The last scripture, the last verse out of the scripture that we started with it says but when the time had fully come God sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law. That we might receive the full rights of sons. I highlighted that God has given us this real estate called earth. Now this real estate through the scripture communicates to us it says that the creator eagerly awaits the manifestation of the true sons of God. Another scripture says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. Another scripture says that, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. There is no greater truth that exists than what is in here. I carry this Bible of mine that is so tattered. I have three Bibles, but this one is my best friend. When Jesus put me through the school of the Spirit, I spent very lonely days with this Bible in my room. When he taught me how to let go of the old man to become the new man, it was all through the reading and studying of the Word. When I studied the word, I did not study it in my own volition. I prayed every time that quicken my spirit, Lord, and reveal your word to me. There's a scripture about an Ethiopian eunuch who read the word but did not understand it. 
And it is only through the, the spirit that you can get interpretation of what the word is saying. The generation that exists here is a generation of solution providers. The, the world is in utter chaos and turmoil and we see it every day. The people who are supposed to bring the solutions. Sometimes we will be fighting for positions and ushering. Because in the church is the only place that we find relevance. But God says that there is more to us and there is more that he has deposited in us. When speaking of the light of the world or the salt of the earth, both light and salt are incredibly influential. If you have a bowl of, if you have a pot with one kg of meat, you do not need one kg of salt. You just need to sprinkle a little bit. God wants us as heirs and as sons to be the influence in various sectors where we are located. When you say that politics is a dirty game, you are the change as an individual that can influence one or two. Jesus influenced 12 individuals. And those 12 individuals turned the world upside down. And now there's millions of us. But even though there are millions of us, we have regressed in our understanding of what God requires of us. We have so much access to knowledge. But the knowledge is useless because we do not understand it. The Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. But in all you're getting of this wisdom, get understanding. We are in a time where God wants to reveal the secrets of his word to us. So that people may ask you, how do you know these things? Before you preach Christ, people are already asking you, what is it about you? After God turned my life around, I went into church at some point and gave my testimony. And it was just as simple as God has turned my life around and he has delivered me from drugs. At some point, I was at home and I got uh, leading from the Spirit to write out this testimony and publish it on social media. I wanted nothing to do with it. I said, God, I've already done the thing. People know that I'm delivered. It's fine. Let's move on. I acceded to the request and wrote my testimony. And the testimony went viral. After it went viral, I got calls to go on radio. And I got calls to go and share it in various platforms. The purpose for my life came in a way that I didn't think that it would come. Up until seven years later, in a week's time, the government is flying me out somewhere and paying me good money to go and say my testimony for about five to seven minutes. 
mo di bikin tse di tam puso e tang tuelela gore ke o filo lengwe ke go bua bo paki jwane and that was what has happened within those 7 years the testimony has had a life of its own me ke sone se se iragetse mo dingwa hentse supatse o bo paki jwane le botshelo jwa jone i have my little brother who serves in the church ke na le nna ke yo direla mo kereke i have lightly uh, shared with him about jesus i have i have never preached to him but he had a front row seat to everything that happened in my life. Majority of his life he saw the things that I did before. And like I said earlier that children are observing the parents are observing the people around them. He fell into the things that I did. He shared it with me. And I have never judged him. I said, oh, that's not a problem. Uh, this is what you can do or this is what you can do. But every time you do it, make sure that you are with the right friends or this and this. I told him how to do the thing that he is do currently doing. Of his own volition, the light of Christ that is in me shone to him. And then he came to me and he says, I have had an encounter with God. And like I'm saying, it was not through me evangelizing to him. But me making an attempt by as little as I can or as much as I can to live like Christ. I, I've never invited him to church even after he told me what he, that he's had an encounter. But he's here in the church and he's serving in the church. <laughs> to conclude my message, I would like to say that God wants to use us. He'd like to use us in a measure more than what he's currently using us. God is infinite. And we cannot bring an end to him. But he wants us to press in. If I'm offering people hugs, you have to come to me and collect the hug. God is offering life and life more abundant. So we need to come to him for the more abundant life. Abundance insinuates that it is gradual, there is more. The word said, the path of the just is a shining light that shineth more and more and more unto the perfect day. May we not end at the first shining. My message to the youth is that God said through his word that in the last days he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And as not maybe, not when, because it's a, it's, it's a continuous process. God is constantly and continually showing up in our lives. Surrender the things that you think that you need, that you're holding on to. To take what God has in store for you. Thank you. Yeah,